Okay, and we're back. We skipped ahead a little bit in the book. Now we're in chapter 14, section 3, which is pages 465 to 471 in your textbook. And today we're going to be looking at abolition and women's rights. All right, so our learning objectives today. You will be able to under, explain how the abolitionist movement changed or challenged the institution of slavery. And you will be able to identify the rights that women fought for in the 1800s. So let's review. So remember where we left off last week. So remember, many Americans began moving westward during the first half of the 1800s. Texas gained independence from Mexico in 1836. The expansion of the United States from coast to coast was guided by the idea of manifest destiny. The United States won the Mexican-American War, gaining a huge area of land known as the Mexican Cession. That's a lot of the southwestern United States now are part of the Mexican Cession. And the newly acquired territory reignites the debate over the expansion of slavery that we thought was settled by the Missouri Compromise in 1820, but it's going to rear its ugly head again. All right, key terms for today. Abolition, that is the movement to stop slavery, to end slavery in the United States. The abolition movement, we would say. An abolitionist is a person who favors the abolition of slavery. The Underground Railroad is a series of escape routes used by slaves to uh, run to freedom. And then the word suffrage means the right to vote. So here's that word from the previous slide, abolitionists, people who support the abolition of slavery. So slavery had been controversial in certain parts of the country for hundreds of years. Quakers took a stand against slavery beginning in the 1600s. So remember, we're all the way in the mid-1800s. So there had been opposition to slavery for over 200 years at this point. And by the late 1700s, the abolitionist movement had begun. So northern states passed anti-slavery laws. And by 1804, decades before the part in the story we're looking at today, most northern states had already abolished slavery. And in 1807, Congress made it illegal to import slaves from Africa. Now, it's important to break that down. It doesn't say that slavery is illegal, but just bringing slaves over from um, Africa to the United States for use in plantations in the South, etc. That was no longer going to be allowed. So the growing abolitionist movement seemed like a good thing to a lot of people. Slavery was an evil institution that destroyed millions of lives over the centuries. Well, who could possibly be against the abolition of slavery? Well, if you are in the South and you own one of these big plantations where maybe you're growing cotton or rice, the economy in the area depended on the work of millions and millions of slaves. The abolitionist movement was seen as a threat to the economy and the Southern way of life. The South was in determined to keep the institution of slavery alive. They do not care for these troublemaking abolitionists at all. They think they're out of line. So publishing was a way that the abolitionists spread their message around the country. So newspapers and pamphlets, which are like, I don't know, like information papers, they were really, really important tools used to spread the ideas. So there was one abolitionist right here named William Lloyd Garrison. He's from Massachusetts. And he was the publisher of a newspaper called The Liberator. It was an abolitionist newspaper, and it was dedicated to the abolition of slavery. That newspaper first debuted in 1831. So to show you that being an abolitionist could be bad for your health, because of his views on abolition, he was almost murdered by a mob of people. So it could be very, very dangerous to be an abolitionist at this time. People took these issues very, very seriously. So here's two powerful abolitionists that maybe you've heard of before. There's Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was a man who was born into slavery. He escaped to the north and gave speeches to abolitionists about his experiences as a slave. But he was afraid that he would be captured by his former master in the northern part of the United States. So he fled to Britain until he earned enough money to purchase or buy his freedom. So then we have Sojourner Truth. She began life as a slave, and she escaped her owners and stayed with a Quaker family. And she drew huge crowds with her speeches on the abolition of slavery. So here are their pictures right here. We have Frederick Douglass over here on the left, and there's Sojourner Truth on the right. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the Underground Railroad before. It was a series of escape routes that were used by slaves who were escaping the South. 
Some abolitionists helped slaves escape to freedom along the Underground Railroad. And it's important to know, and I'm sure you know this already, but it's worth revisiting that the Underground Railroad was not underground. It was not tunnels or anything like it. It was not a railroad. It was a bunch of above-ground escape routes that would guide escaped slaves to, slaves to freedom. So on these routes, you would have to cover this sometimes really, really long distances, either on foot or by boat or by wagon. In some cases, you could maybe get onto a train car to help move north. Most slaves moved at night and hid during the day to avoid being spotted and caught. They would hide in places like stables and cellars and attics, and those were known as stations on the Underground Railroad. So here's a map of some of the, uh, the routes that we're talking about on the Underground Railroad. You don't see any train cars, and you don't see any tunnels, so these arrows do a pretty good job of showing you the direction that these slaves from these slave-holding states down here that are orange the routes that they took to get up to freedom, ultimately, up in Canada. So people who helped runaway slaves were called conductors. And the most famous conductor, there was just a movie released about her, was Harriet Tubman, who herself had escaped slavery at an early age. So Harriet Tubman made a total of 19 trips on the Underground Railroad to uh, free enslaved people. She was never caught, and she never lost a passenger. So around the same time that the abolitionist movement is picking up steam, we see the beginning of the women's rights movements. So white abolitionists began to realize that their rights were, that, uh, that uh, women's rights were very limited too. Women were expected at this time to stay out of public life and were kept from making public speeches. They couldn't vote. They couldn't serve on juries or hold public office. That means being an elected official, something like a mayor or a, or a congressman or something. So many abolitionists supported expanding rights for women, too. So in 1848, we see the Seneca Falls Convention. So it was a, a convention entirely focused on the rights of women. So the convention was uh, led by a woman named Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, who were two abolitionists. So at the Seneca Falls Convention, women expressed their desire for more rights, including suffrage or the right to vote. It would be some time before women would get that, that uh, um, right to vote. So I'm going to turn you guys loose on a little bit of a casual research project today. So we just did an overview of some of these abolitionists and figures in the women's rights movement. I want you to go a little bit deeper. So you're going to do a bit of research and then submit five interesting facts about the person you've chosen into a Google form in Google Classroom. So you can choose from these people right here. William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and Harriet Beecher Stowe. You need to use these sites for your research, Discovery Ed, History.com, Britannica, Worldbook, or any of the library databases you find on the BRMS site. All right, I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with. Have a great week.